Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. It's time for part two on Judaism, and uh, tonight's topic is titled Torah, the Written Law, and uh, all of the citations that we're going to be going through tonight, anyone can fact check. We had a number of people last week uh, asking about the citations and whatnot, um, and uh, some of them, uh, you know, going through the Talmud and whatnot and picking out uh, just one line out of the Talmud and not uh, taking the full context of it. We're going to, this is still not about the Talmud yet, nor was last week's. We haven't even gotten to that yet. But we uh, will be in this series probably next week or week after. And uh, it's really interesting to see people's reaction to this episode. I prefaced last week's show stating that I'll probably get more hate and, and attacks against me uh, for doing this series than I have since coming out against psychedelics and exposing it as the true MK Ultra program. And uh, I got to say, I was about uh, accurate on that statement. And uh, the attacks have been uh, really interesting to observe. Um, Lloyd is, of course, back with us. It's been uh, a really interesting time for him to go through all of this research. Welcome back, Lloyd. Thank you. Glad to be on again. And uh, I, I wanted to say I had to, you know, I've got boxes of books all over the house, and it took me about a half an hour today going through all the boxes to find this. But I did find my uh, Michael Hoffman book, uh, Judaism Discovered. So I was happy to find that. And uh, some interesting uh, stuff in here. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of the same mistakes that uh, we've been exposing in uh, other places. And I'm I plan to go into more in depth on this book in the uh, coming weeks in this series. But um, what I want to start off with before we dive into the meat of this show is um, the difference between primary versus secondary, third hand, and fourth hand citations. So if Lloyd and I are reading primary citations <clears throat> and somebody says, if you want to know the truth, you have to have on Michael Hoffman. Well, Michael Hoffman is a secondary citation. He's not a primary citation. See, the difference between a primary citation is that would be uh, you know, if, I, if I'm citing a primary citation, it means like, for instance, if I'm citing the Bible, I go directly to the Bible to talk about the Bible. I don't go to a minister or a priest or Joe Schmo standing on the corner and ask him about what the Bible says. I go directly to the Bible to understand what the Bible says. Instead of going to Michael Hoffman to tell me what the Talmud says, I go directly to the Talmud to know what the Talmud says. So uh, what happens is when we appeal to authority, that's known as the ad veracunium fallacy, uh, we're, we're relying on some quote-unquote authority to uh, tell us what to think rather than trusting ourselves and our own intellects to verify the citations on our own. So... Uh, saying I have to go to Michael Hoffman or E. Michael Jones to know what the Bible says or to know what uh, the Talmud says, etc., that is appealing to a secondhand uh, citation rather than a primary. And then a thirdhand citation would be, let's say, somebody else who cites Michael Hoffman who then might cite the Talmud. Or a fourthhand would be somebody citing somebody who cites Michael Hoffman, who cites the Talmud. So then we get out there, and then it gets further and further and further away from the primary or the original source. And I noticed that in this field, most people can't tell the difference between primary, secondary, and third-hand citations. And when we were going through all of this, you know, people were telling us, oh, well, you're using the wrong Talmud, or you have to interview somebody else. 
One thing that we couldn't get out of people is which version of the Talmud they were using to get the fake quotes from, you know, so that we could verify them. Not one person would tell us which version of the Talmud they got their fake quotes from. And thank you, Dashing Rogue and Anthony, for your support. But uh, it gets really interesting, like, why won't, why do they, all of these people refuse to tell us where they get their citations from? And then it's like, oh, the online version that we've been using, which is the uh, uh, Seferia website, uh, that's the, the wrong watered-down Goy version, and you're using the wrong version. Okay, well, just well, tell us which version uh, uh, you're getting it from. And I have it shown on screen here, the uh, safaria.org, and you just click right here on Talmud, and then you can go through that. And then somebody what said... To ask, well, why there was no question about the quality of the Talmud they were quoting. Right, I'm well, told- sure, sure. And, and I'm getting that to that too, but... You know, somebody said, uh, you know, well, you have to cite the 1935 edition. So then one person quoted from that, and it matched almost exactly with the one we were quoting. So clearly, uh, there wasn't any difference. But nobody is, like Lloyd just said, nobody is uh, verifying the accuracy of the of the fake citations. Nor will they even tell us which talmud that they got them from and nobody is telling us how they verified these if they check them themselves or if they're using second third fourth fifth hand citations etc which appears to be the case so i wanted to start off this discussion by just making it clear what is a primary citation because you know if you have to appeal to authority to e michael jones or michael hoffman or whomever to tell you what to think, rather than just opening the text and reading them yourselves, your your uh, your self esteem is shot, and you you know, and you're not getting to the primary source. How do you know that Michael Hoffman is telling the truth and skimming some of the citations that he uses in this uh, tome? Uh, they there are several that I spotted right away, and I will get into them in the coming weeks that are clearly misrepresented. So unless we go in and we're checking each of these primary citations against the secondary source, they're not, uh, the secondary source is not reliable. So I would appreciate it if uh, the people who cite these things would tell us which version of the Talmud that they did get their fake citations from. That would be a big help. Um, rather than attacking us for using the wrong one, just present to us which one you are using. That would be a lot easier so that we can all verify it. Um, And before we get started here, I just want to read uh, a couple of comments here. So uh, Dashing Rogue says, you're not going to get more hate, you're going to get more money. And this is a super chat. He says, keep up the great work, Jan. Tip every sacred cow seek and ye shall find. Amen. And yes, we are, this is a sacred cow barbecue. So get out your barbecue sauce and your bib and uh, we're going to get messy here. And Anthony says, good evening, Rabbi Jonstein Ben Irving bomb. Okay. Interesting. And he threw up 10 bucks. He says some early shekels for you. Just kidding. Had to rib you before the trolls get to you. Uh, Thanks for that, Anthony. And then Jennifer says, off topic, uh, like to collaborate, send an email. Um, And this is definitely off topic. So anyway, um, well, we've got a lot to cover. So sorry for the long segue there, but uh, let's dig in, Lloyd. Yeah, well, Fibonacci says Talmudic defenders, the Zionists would be proud we're not defending the Talmud. We're simply going through the claims that have been made one by one to assess them for accuracy. We have lots of critical things to say about the Talmud, but we're discussing mostly the Torah and we've been sidetracked because of audience comments and such into the Talmud. But we've been proving that these citations one by one that people, these claims people are making about the Talmud are false. Now, We're not defending the Talmud. We're saying, why are you lying about these quotes? If the Talmud is so bad, why do you need to make up quotes? Last week, someone said that 
the books that we couldn't find are because they haven't been translated. No, the books are a fabrication. Those titles, those names do not exist. Well, and, and, and if they but haven't been translated, then where did they get their quotes from? You know, and again, they won't, That's and they won't point. tell us where they got them from. And so, so I think it's, there's a risk to people who've been, who've been passing these around, who've been bandwagoning that haven't checked their sources, haven't checked their citations and would be embarrassed if they've been perpetuating these falsified quotes. Uh, we just want to separate what is factual from what we, anyone, from what our sources are public, anyone can check them. Sorry, I'm going to switch to headphones here. I just realized I didn't even have them on. Excuse me just a second, folks. All right. Hold on a second. Let me make let me just check your uh, audio here, make sure it's still rolling properly. Speak. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a concern with the fact that the bulk of, in fact, almost every single claim they make about the Talmud is to be found in the Quran and within Islam, within the primary text of Islam, which we covered in the previous series. And like uh, uh, sorry, uh, just to say, I would just wanted to say thanks to uh, Infinity Split for the uh, uh, donation there. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's, the positivity is very, very much, very much appreciated. It really offsets a lot of the negativity we've been dealing with. Uh, again, our sources are public. Anyone can check them. You know, everything that I say, you have my public sources, it's on screen, and I mention them. So there's nothing that I'm using a secret source that you can't find. Right. Well, and Fibonacci is going on saying only some books of the Talmud are not translated. Can uh, Fibonacci, please tell us which ones are not translated and where you folks got the fake quotes from. Yeah. How did you get the fake quotes in the first place? There's a if, common quote about the book called Libra David. Sure, if you can get me a copy of the book, love to see it. You know, there's yeah. others, but um, that, that one's the most common. Um, yeah, so, so where do we... Um, so shall we pick it up, Jan? Uh, from yeah, let's. Uh, you know what? I think you forgot to send me your notes this week. So, uh, oh, do you yeah. do you want to uh, email those to me really quickly so that I can get those? Yeah, let me send you an email with um, Jan Irvin. So these are my this is my first set. It's just my opening notes. Um, and the first set's on its way. All right, thank you. Um, I'll send you the rest as we go on YouTube. Okay, and um, I will send you, this is not entirely complete, but I will send these to you as well. So uh, Peaceful Pogrom says Sanhedrin had some disturbing uh, stuff we'll retrieve for you. We've, we've already gone through those and we're not going to water down any of the ones that are negative. This isn't to water it down, this is to get to the truth of these citations. Yeah. So, you know, I just find really interesting the the lies and the name calling that these people who are defending this agenda are using and, uh, you know, not being supportive. You know, they're not even interested in what the truth is. They're only interested in promoting their, their hate agenda, apparently. So that's, you know, rather sad, in, in my opinion. Thanks, uh, Mr. Winters, also for your support. Thank you very much, guys. I, I really, um, the, the positivity and, and just, just these gifts, it'll, it'll help me go buy a couple of books and resources I need to do more research. This is um, some things I want to get more information on, and it's not all publicly available. Sometimes you actually have to spend money to get the necessary notes. Operation Pro Talmud, no. Uh, it's called Operation Truth and Exposing Lies. So try to wrap your mind around that. If you guys are spreading lies out there, don't you want to know what the truth is? Uh, if it's Christian to be in truth or in logos, and you're all spreading false quotes or taking quotes out of context, wouldn't you rather know? It's not being pro-Talmud. We've already said that where there are things that need to be discussed and exposed in the Talmud, we will discuss them. But, yeah. you know, you have to have an, an iota of intellectual honesty, which I don't see from these people who yeah. are, well, uh, that, you know, trolling. I think we made our point. We'll, let's get to the facts and um, yep. 
Did I share my screen again? And we'll. Uh... Yeah, let's dig in. I'll go to my main screen. Okay, give it a few seconds to come up. We're seeing it. Yep, it's coming up on the uh, feed as well. There it is. Okay. Um, again, so citations are important. Now, last week, some people just dropped random quotes on me. Um, the, the point is the citation is in support of an argument. So make a point, make a statement, state your position, and then say, and the citations are your evidence for your position, right? That's what we mean by citation. Don't just drop a random quote and say, well, now what? You know, take a position. Now, some people were afraid to take a position because maybe they get proven wrong and then they can't wiggle out of it. So, you know, not taking a position is, is not, it's not an intellectually honest approach. Now, a couple of quotes before we go. There's a common saying in Western culture that says, nowadays anyway, politics is downstream from culture. I believe that's first attributed to Andrew Breitbart. There's a second part of that saying, culture is downstream from religion. Look at the regions of the world. Right? So if politics is downstream from culture, culture is downstream from religion. Keep that in mind. Now notice that Islam makes no distinction between religion and politics. Another point, Hamas is a religious theocracy, just like Iran, just like Saudi Arabia. Hamas is a religious theocracy. Read their, um, their not their creed, no, their creed, the Hamas Charter. I went through some of it in one of the previous episodes. Remember that. Again, this is worth emphasizing. War is deceit. That was said by the Islamic prophet Muhammad 1,400 years ago. This quote is from Sahih Bukhari, 52, 269, which is book 52 called Fighting for the Cause of Allah, Jihad. Hadith number 269 in volume 4. War is deceit. If Islam is the religion of peace, why do they have a book called Fighting for the Cause of Allah, Jihad, and mentioning that war is deceit? In the Western world, another point, we have a saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. What few people know in Islam, what Muslims say is, do not let your enemy know he is your enemy. Keep that in mind. If war is deceit, then do not let your enemy know he is your enemy. Now, a quote I want to mention. This is from 1884 by Pope Leo XIII. Let no man think that he may for any reason whatsoever join the Masonic sect if he values his Catholic name and his eternal salvation as he ought to value them. Let no one be deceived by a pretense of honesty. Now he speaks of the artifices used by societies of this kind in seducing men, depravity of their opinions and the wickedness of their acts. This was at, given at St. Peter's in Rome in, in April 1884. And he was discussing, he goes on to say, let us remember that Christianity and Freemasonry are irreconcilable so that enrollment in one means separation from the other. In 1974, the Catholic Church forbid any Catholics to join any of these organizations, including the Masons, they would be excommunicated. In 1981, this was said to be in full force and has not been modified. Excommunication or other penalties have not been abrogated. Uh, I'm not sure if this is still in effect, but back then this was also put out. I went through the Vatican website. The popes have come out heavily against groups like the Masons, especially the Masons. Now, I, want, I came across this this week. In 8,800, 50,000 Catholics were slaughtered by Muslims in the city of Fez or near the city of Fez in Morocco. The Fez cap is a symbol of the Muslim victory over the Christians. Now we have an organization called the Shriners who wear the Fez and the caps were first commercially manufactured and sold in Fez in Morocco. Now you may know the, the Shriners are closely linked to the Masonic order. These are the Fezes worn by the Shriners. Notice the word emblazoned on the cap. Notice the sword of Muhammad, the sword of Allah, and the Islamic crescent and star, Muslim. And this is four swords that make up the two M's in the word. Islam, Allah, Abdullah, slave of Allah, Nile. These are all shrine symbols. Now we go to this is an original, an early KKK outfit. This is a KKK uniform. 
notice the crescent and the star, the Islamic crescent and star. Look here again, another photo of an early KKK outfit, Islamic crescent and star. I found this in another video talking about the subject and I need to look deeper into this to verify a lot of it. But just at first glance, it looks a little unusual. Why are the KKK promoting the Islamic symbol? What I did not know until recently was that the holy book of the KKK is called the Quran. The Holy Book of Islam is the Quran, and the Holy Book of the KKK is the Quran. Um, here we go, another picture there, the Quran. So you tell me, Quran, Quran. Now the Shriners, back to the Shriners. History of the AAONMS, Ancient Arabic Order, Nobles, Mystic, Shrine. These are the Shriners. And as you know, they're closely linked to the Freemasons. And here we have the Abu Ben Adam Shrine Mosque, A-A-O-N-M-S, 1922. Now, we are constantly told, and also the letters A-A-O-N-M-S on anagram of a mason. Now, we are constantly told various things about certain groups of people that did this or guilty of that. Why has this never been discussed? Why are the Shriners clearly an Islamic organization, clearly promoting Allah, promoting Islam, Muslims, and the KKK with their Quran. Why has this, this never been investigated or looked at deeper? Are we only allowed to investigate the Jews? Are we only allowed to investigate the Crips, but never the Bloods? Who are the Bloods paying off? Why are the Bloods paying off the cops to, to stay away from investigating them? I need to ask that question. Islam, this is a, an American. This is an American. Quran, the potentate. Abu Ben Adam, keg patrol. Arabia, Arabia, Arabia. Now, this is the ISIS symbol. It's the Saudi Arabian symbol. This is the black flag of Muhammad. This is the black flag of Islam. Look at the cross swords. Let's go look at a, at a Freemason lodge. And here we have the crossed swords, the scimitars of Islam, crossed on the desk. Wait, are you saying that there are ties to Islam and Freemasonry and the Shriners and the KKK? Because That's, we're, we're told that they're purely Jewish organizations. And what you're showing here is that, you know, uh, to... These you know, have Islamic links. That these have Islamic links. So, well, if there's Islamic links, then why is everyone hyper-focused... Just on, just, on, just on Judaism. So it seems right. to me like they don't want us focused on this stuff. It's like when you realize that that Jesus in Christianity is and, and the God of Christianity is logos or truth, logic, reason. And, and then you realize that a law is will. And then you realize, wait a second, well, Crowley and all of these guys were into do what thou wilt is the whole of the law, will. And then you have Sabbatai Zevi, who uh, supposedly converted to Islam, and he was a big occultist. And then you have Hassani Sabah that all these people worshipped, Leary worshipped, uh, Timothy Leary worshipped Hassani Sabah, etc. So why... Are they wanting us to focus on only uh, Judaism? Now, it right. seems like there is, you know, like I said last week, that there is a bait and switch going on here. And, you know, somebody is, you know, I don't know if these people are Islamists or what, and they only want us focused on Judaism. But uh, it seems like there is a bait and switch going on. And they only want us focused in one direction. Now, why would Crowley be going around saying, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law, when Islam's God is will and Christianity's God is logos or truth? That's why when you go into a court, you place your hand on the Bible, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And yeah. so, you know, this is the war, the battle between... Christianity, Logos, and, and yeah. Judaism was originally founded in Logos too, and granted they fell, and we'll go through that more as we get into this series. But 
Islam is not based in Logos. It is based on will, and in fact, it's based on the will of Muhammad, and whatever Muhammad said is halal. And so, you know, you know, so we're looking at all of this uh, Islamic symbolism and Freemasonry and the Shriners and the KKK, and yeah. then people are telling us that this is Jewish symbolism. Now we've really, we've 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 already determined, we've already proven that Islam is highly, highly um, antithetical to both Christianity and Judaism. They hate the Jews. They hate the Christians. Notice this lost Masonic symbol. Um, I need to look deeper into this. I came across these, so uh, but I need to spend more time looking into this and a certain and making sure of the of, you know of the, the the accuracy of what I'm saying here. But this is the decapitation of the old world order before introducing a new world order. Apparently, that's the meaning of the symbol. This is the Islamic scimitar. This is a Muslim sword, the sword of Muhammad. That's not a Western sword. And this is part of a Freemason symbol. Why is that? Why is there Islam temple, A-A-O-N-M-S? Why the Islamic symbolism? Why the Islamic symbolism? Why all of this Islamic symbolism? And no one has ever mentioned it. So, you know, especially in relation to the Shriners and the Freemasons and the KKK. If, if, the, if these organizations have been infiltrated or have been founded by Islamic infiltrators and agents, then why has that never been discussed? So I'll just leave that at, I'll leave it at that. I, this is worth exploring, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Think about this. Why the Islamic symbolism in all of these organizations that no one has yet discussed? I've never seen anyone discuss it. And it's not hard to find. I, I just have to stumble across it because I was looking for something. Yeah, I don't know why there's such heavy <clears throat> misdirection. You know, yeah. people clearly don't want this discussed. You know, it, it really begins to look like the effort to cover all of this up is being done by Islamists to intentionally misdirect people to only look at Judaism. And that's not to say, again, and I've repeated this so many times, it's not to say that Judaism is totally innocent of everything, and we're going to go into that. That's what this series is about. But, um, you know, why are people so focused on Judaism and ignoring all of these blatant citations and everything, it seems like intentional uh, misdirection and misinformation to me. Yeah. Uh, a couple of things. Notice this. If a goy hits a Jew, he must be killed. If a Jew finds an object lost by a goy, it does not have to be returned. Baba Mezia 24A. We'll be going one by one through all of these quotes and quotes like this that someone posted. But notice, these are paraphrases of the actual quotes. They're not well, the well, but hey, you know, if you are, you know, the people who cite these, they don't have to read any further than these quotes here. And yeah. that is the gospel truth yeah. because they have just read those one liners and there is yeah. a citation number behind them and they've never even checked them themselves. So they no. don't even need a primary citation to fact check it or to put it in context with the surrounding information. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some comments. To, yeah. Let's, let's, let's go through these comments. Let's go up. Oh uh, yeah. We just wanted to, and then we're done. So someone wasn't happy. I said, look, if my question was, if five of the laws of Noah are in the 10 commandments, so five of the laws of Noah are the 10 commandments. The, and those are the, the Noah hide laws to make clear. Yeah, correct. Then are the 10 commandments, the Moses hide laws. That was my question. Right? Are the Moses Hyde laws, the Ten Commandments, now a Jewish conspiracy to force the Ten Commandments on the world? Do we need to worry? Now, sure, I was being a little tongue in cheek. Um, and of course, this was the response, right? That I need to, yeah, anyway. Um, and then Fibonacci previously was, um, had some words to say about the Talmud. He knows it's an evil, God forsaken book. And anyone seeking to clarify or defend is demented or attempting to soften its image. We are simply trying to establish the fact behind or the truth behind these quotes that people are putting out about the Talmud. If we disprove them, if we show that these, these, these quotes don't exist or they are not what people claim, doesn't that mean that people are then citing falsified statements? And why are you repeating falsified statements, right? Why, why are you so working so hard to prevent us from getting to the facts? Yeah, and these, these guys right here that you have on screen in particular, they, they seem really invested in hiding the truth. I find that very 
interesting yeah. that they don't want people looking up the primaries and they'll post only these citations, you know, like the ones that you showed above, they'll post only those and none of the surrounding discussion that puts it in context. Yeah. So, you know, like we showed last week, you might have the very next line that debunks that line, but they won't cite that. We, they'll they'll only cite the one line. Yeah, as we did last week, I uh, went through the punishment of a Gentile who studies Torah is execution by stoning. Fine. But the next line says a Gentile who, in the conclusion, though, is a Gentile who engages in Torah study is considered like a high priest. Why do we only hear this piece and why do they ignore the next sentence? Yeah, Those are valid that's, questions. That's, and that's very dishonest behavior. Go back to that for a second, because uh, what I wanted to say about that passage is somebody also checked that in the 1935 edition. And it also a, checked and it also checked out and they told us, you know, hey, you know, you're wrong. And then they quoted the 1935 and it was actually almost identical. So, yeah, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, there for whatever reason, they don't want people to know that it says in the very next paragraph there that a Gentile who studies the Torah is considered like a high priest. So why focus only on the stoning part? And then, of course, even after the show, after we had the whole discussion, I had you know, at least, you know, three or four people send me the first part without the second part after we had even covered it. Right. Um, yes. So, uh, sorry, I saw something funny in the comments. Okay. So now this is a bit of a digression. We didn't want to go here because we wanted to talk about the Torah, but we've been dragged into the Talmud, but I need to clarify from comments that were made. I want to skip to another section. I'll spend a few minutes here. European human rights chiefs order the British press not to reveal when terrorists are Muslims and crack down on freedom of speech. Wait, hold on a second, Lloyd. Now, this is old news because this article is um, three days old. Okay, and this is, well, it's a little old. I'm just being yeah. tongue in cheek there. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Um, but Brunei, this is new. Brunei to punish gay sex with death by stoning under Sharia law. The Sultan has said he considers the new law to be a form of special guidance from Allah. Um, they want to introduce death by stoning as punishment for gay sex and other crimes too, not just that. Cutting off of hands, all those things are in the Quran or in the Sharia. Brunei to pass law that will punish gay sex with death by stoning. There's been dozens of articles written about this recently. Joe Biden, stoning people to death for homosexuality or adultery is appalling and immoral, right? There is no excuse for this kind of hate and inhumanity. CNN, starting next week, Brunei will punish gay sex and adultery with death by stoning. I suppose that this man... Wait, are, is, are these news articles fake? I mean, you know, can people go to March 25th and 28th and 29th last week and actually look up these news articles? Or are we just, like, making up all of these main yeah. uh, these uh, this news is headlines? This is Hudad. Remember, I, I said once, if if... America becomes an Islamic country and Sharia gets enforced. This becomes the law of the land. This is a fact. The fact that we're not seeing Sharia heavily imposed in most countries is a godsend. But if someone follows Sharia fully, like, like ISIS did or like Muhammad did, this is the norm. Let's go. Palestinian cleric. France will become an Islamic country through jihad. We will fight them until the entire world is subject to the rule of Islam. I thought jihad was about self-improvement, eating salads, going to the gym more often, but apparently not. And he said, so the Iranian, okay, Iranian lawyer who defended women's rights to remove hijab gets 38 years in prison and 148 lashes. Go Islam. Look, yeah, uh, all, all these people in the chat that are into uh, promoting these fake quotes, they only they, see they refuse to cite any of the surrounding text. And again, I'm just going to say this one last time. This episode is about the Torah. We're not to the Talmud yet. Try to grasp that yeah. concept. This is so, about the Torah. Hold on. Hold on. This is about the Torah, not the Talmud. And, uh, you know, this person, VB, is constantly posting all of these uh, citations out of context, Sanhedrin, 74b, etc. These people clearly have not gone into the Talmud to read the full context. We just showed one on screen how people left out the surrounding quotes. Have the brains to go into the Talmud yourselves and check the full context of the passages before you keep 
posting them over and over like brainless idiots. It's not that hard to open a book and read the full context. Try to get that into your brains. Thanks. And that's the last time I'm going to say yeah. that. So notice that under Jewish law, stoning is also a punishment, but no one gets stoned in Israel, but people are getting whipped and stoned to death in Islamic countries. Right? Hamas opens fire on Palestinian civilians protesting terror groups' oppression, March 15th. Um, Hamas is a religious theocracy, and they oppress their people. Their president was elected for a four-year term. He's now in year number 15 of his four-year term and hasn't had elections since he was elected. He also killed his opposition. So you might want to think about Hamas being the good guys. This isn't a Muslim lawmaker. She was elected in Pennsylvania. She's Pennsylvania's first female Muslim lawmaker in the General Assembly. A prayer was used to start the session. And she said that the prayer was Islamophobic and highly offensive to her. So think about that. Just think about it. I'm not going to provide comment. Think about it. Slavery in Libya, where you can buy a black man for $400. Libya, as you know, is a Jewish country. Now, this the Jewish is or Islamic, you mean? Jewish country. I, I meant Jewish. It's a, obviously a Jewish country. You can only buy slaves in Jewish countries. Oh, oh, I see. You're being snarky. Got it. Yes. Anti-Muslim incidents in the USA, 273. Violence against Jews, 938. Four times more violence. Anti-Christian incidents. Um, there are a lot more violent incidents against Jews than there are against Christians. Sorry, I'm sorry, than there are against Muslims. Nigeria, oh, sorry, Kenya attack, 147 dead. This was last week. Not a peep in the news. That's Christians targeted by Muslims. Nigeria, Muslims burn four churches and 28 homes, rape and murder Christian women in raids on Christian villages. Not a peep. Muslim terrorists, merciless killing of Nigerian, Nigerian Christians. Not a peep in the news. This is the 10th church in Paris to be burned, to be attacked since February. 10 churches. This is the second largest church in Paris after Notre Dame. This is arson. It was deliberately attacked. Newsweek. Christian persecution and genocide is worse now than any time in history. Why would that be? Yeah, well, you know, look at how much we see here for even daring to expose this stuff by the yep. Islamists. I mean... You know, look at all these Islamists in the, uh, you know, chat and whatever who are just, right. you know, absolutely outraged that this stuff is being exposed. All the focus has to be on Judaism. They do not want any focus whatsoever on Islam. It's yep. it's a total cover up. Yep. Turkey wipes out the Christian culture of occupied Cyrus. More than 550 churches, chapels and monasteries have been pillaged, vandalized and demolished. Sudan, church pastor murdered with family for preaching the gospel, another Jewish country. And he was, they wanted him to rape his daughter and he wouldn't, but ended up killing them. 300 Nigerian Christians killed, world silent. Another Jewish country, Nigeria. Fulani terrorists, Jews, obviously. Brunei then defends its right to stone people to death for homosexuality and adultery under strict new Sharia laws. They will implement the laws from April 3rd, including amputation for theft. If you read the Quran, I believe you will find that. Um, so, yes. And it is enforcing these more strictly than Malaysia and Indonesia, who have both started enforcing this. Pure genocide. Over 6,000 Nigerian Christians slaughtered, mostly women and children. Omar, <laughs> okay, she, Ilan Omar, refuses to condemn gays being stoned to death under Sharia law all violence against Israel from Hamas um, seems to have an agenda. And um, the Middle East Forum defends the right to discuss Islam in Europe because the European Human Rights Court backs a Sharia blasphemy law. You know, if you criticize Muslims on Twitter in the UK, the police will come knock on your door and people are being arrested. People are being sent to jail for criticizing Islam. A woman said in a private meeting that Muhammad was a pedophile for marrying a six-year-old girl and having sex with her while she was still a minor, and she was then tried in court for that. She's, and that's blasphemy. Now, ask yourself, you know, why Muslims are pressing for blasphemy laws in Europe? You think about that for a minute. The OIC is a block of 57 Islamic countries, and they are pressing Western countries into making it a crime to criticize Islam or Muhammad. 
So ponder these things. I'll leave those for you. Okay, any any last minute comments before we step on to the next section? No, I still see people spreading the the majority fake quotes from the Talmud, even though we've well, already addressed, you know, what primary citations are, et cetera, how to fact check these. And and the comment is just going wild. A lot of with... these people are a lot of these people are obviously very friendly. For for instance, the people who gave us grief with when we discussed Islam are the very same people now aligning with those people who are making these hit videos against myself and Yun in these channels. So the same Muslims who were criticizing us are now very much buddy buddy in the comment sections of these other channels. And not only that, these supposed Christians or atheists are now using precisely the same arguments that the Islamic apologists were using. So clearly they're swapping notes. Yeah, okay. that's true. So now moving on. So now the word goy, I want to do a discussion on the word goy. We'll start with that. Um, goy in Hebrew means nation. Goy just means nation. Jews are also called goy in the Bible. For instance, they called le goy gadol in Genesis 12 verse 2 which means I will make you into a great nation. Now, calling non-Jews goyim, or the, which is the plural of goy, simply translates to nations, meaning the other nations of the world. The Latin translation is gentilis from Italian gente, and it entered into English in the form of the word Gentiles. Now, this is the Blue Letter Bible. You'll see here, I will make thee a great nation. This number here, H1471, is the Strong's Concordance number. I'm going to go to this link now. It's going to open in my browser here on the right. And I'm bringing up this page. The tools are loading. So I will make you a great nation. And you see here the word goi, goi. I will play this. Strong's H1471. Goi. Goi. Can you, uh, you didn't share audio when you do, when you did that, your audio isn't shared. Can you try to reshare your screen and make sure the audio is shared this time? Okay. So let me share. Uh, it just says share computer sound. Okay. I'm sharing computer sound. Okay. All right. So, now it's up. Go ahead. Okay. So I will play this nation. So let's do this. Strong's age 1471. Goy. Yeah, it's barely audible. I don't know why. Oh, sorry. It says so if you go to if you go to the blue letter Bible and go to Genesis twelve two and you play this, it says Goy. Strong's age fourteen seventy one. Goy. And this Goy. is the blue letter Bible. It's just blue letter Bible dot org and you can and you can go through all that. So we're just gonna have to read these out loud. Yeah, and that says Goy. Now, if we go to this link, which is the second link here, it brings us back and it says again. Strong's age, 1471. Goy. So I'm not sure, but that goy. says goy. All it says is goy. All right. And it says here that it is nation. It is used 374 times in the King's James Bible. It's used as heathen 143 times. Gentiles is 30 times and people 11 times. Nowhere does it talk about what people commonly assert to be the meaning of which goy. is animals and locusts etc yeah now if we look it's a masculine noun nation people nation people usually of non-hebrew people of descendants of abraham and of israel so even israelis are goy even jews are goy descendants of abraham these are jews are goy now it does say a secondary meaning of swarm of locusts other animals but notice the plural, goyim is just nations. No other meaning. Goyim is nations. So everyone seems to want to, where possible, try to smear Judaism or the Jews with the worst possible interpretations of anything, including just lies and, and direct fabrications. Whereas when it comes to Islam, it's a matter of trying to whitewash it. Now, so you guys can go through this on the Blue Letter Bible site and determine that for yourself. But Goy is just nations. Okay, moving on. So the most commonly now to find a word that is derogatory, the most commonly used word for a non-Jew is Goy. But the word Goy just means nations, okay? Which means nations other than the children of Israel. There is nothing inherently insulting about the word Goy. 
right? The Torah refers to the Israelis or the Jews as Goy. In Exodus 19.6, right? It, God says the children of Israel will be a kingdom. Now, the term Goy, obviously people have been trying to make that out to be such an insulting term, which is not, but the actual term would be Shiksa. The more insulting term for non-Jews is Shiksa, feminine, and Shkutz, masculine, right? Loathsome or abomination. Right. So, and it usually refers to someone. So Jews are opposed to intermarriage, but then again, so are Muslims. No one seems to complain about that, but then they're a very small population. They 15 to 16 million people worldwide. Now, notice though, that here we've got Goy, non-Jew, right? It's applied to the Israelites in Genesis, in all, Genesis, in Exodus, Deuteronomy um, 10, Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 9, 14, Numbers, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. So there's multiple instances where even the Israelis, are, or the Jews, are called Goy, right? And again, here, right? And Goy, again, Gentiles. I went and looked up multiple different definitions. This is an encyclopedia. And if you look at all of these references, it occurs in passages referring to Israelites, Genesis 12, Deuteronomy 32, Joshua 3, 4, 10, 2 Samuel 7, Isaiah 1 and 4, Zechariah 2, 9. It is quite a common term. Now, the Gentiles were far less differentiated from the Israelites in the Old Testament than in the New Testament, right? Under Old Testament regulations, they were just non-Israelites. In other words, not from the stock of Abraham, but they were not hated and they were to be treated on a, on a plane of equality. Notice Deuteronomy 10, because the Gentile stranger enjoyed the hospitality who was commanded to love him. Deuteronomy 10, 19, and you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves are foreigners in Egypt. You are to sympathize, for you know the heart of the stranger, seeing you are strangers in the land of Egypt. Exodus 23, 9, right? The Gentiles had the right of asylum in the cities of refuge, the same as the Israelites. Now, this would be part of the Torah, which is part of the written law, right? The Mosaic law. So that's Numbers 35. They might even possess Israelite slaves, Leviticus 25.47. Um, let me click on that. So if a foreigner residing among you becomes rich, which means foreigners residing amongst the Jews could become rich, and any of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to the foreigner or to the member of the foreigner's clan, that could happen. They, so Israelites could become slaves. Now, if this... That already starts to should get, cause some doubt in the claims about, oh, the Israelites are going to enslave every Gentile. No, because it says here very clearly that the reverse could also be true. And they must not, the, also the Israelites, and I will get through this as well, will not defraud any Gentiles of their pay. Pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and counting on it. Otherwise, they may cry to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. And also, foreigners could inherit in Israel, even as late as the exile in Ezekiel. And for the foreigners residing among you, you are to consider them as native-born Israelites. Consider them as native-born Israelites. In whatever tribe a foreigner resides, there you are to give them their inheritance, declares the sovereign Lord. You cannot withhold their inheritance from them. They were allowed to offer sacrifices at the temple, which they had to do on their own. Right? And also prayers and sacrifices were to be offered for Gentiles in Gentile cities. Seek the place, Jeremiah 29, 7. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So notice that there is this situation where, I mean, these quotes should really start to run counter to the typical misinformation or the misquotes that we are given with regards to the Torah and with regards to the, um, to the, to the Jews. Any comments from you again? No, I'm just, uh, you know, all, you know, for anybody who's calling this disinformation or whatever, uh, Lloyd is, if, if you look right here on screen and this might be a really difficult concept for some of you, but Lloyd is showing the primary citations where he got each uh, quote and each statement, like Quran ninety eight point six through eight, Deuteronomy fourteen two. So that means you can pick up a Bible or pick up the Quran and go to those pages and fact check those actual lines. Those would be what I explained at the start of the show. What are primary citations? So each yep. thing we're showing here. Anyone can go and check. So try to follow along. I know that, 
you know, may seem uh, quite difficult for some of you to grasp that you can actually look things up and check them, but it is actually possible yeah. to to do that and to verify the research. And, you know, uh, somebody on screen there just said that he did uh, verify a lot of this over the last couple of weeks. So thank you. Uh, we appreciate that. At least, you know, some people do still have the the cognitive functioning to realize that they can fact check. So good on you uh, for, for doing that. And we encourage everyone to go through and not just pull up one line and go, oh, look, th that line is there. You have to read all of the surrounding paragraphs and get things taken in context. I'm not sure if, you know, if many of you are capable of, of understanding what in context means, yeah. you know, and getting the surrounding meaning of the discussion. So, you know, it's, it do, might be deep for some of you. I'm going to do one more thing. So I wanted to just simply talk about the, the Torah, the written law, right? The law of Moses and go through those notes and cover it and not get sucked into the Talmud. Unfortunately, because of the kind of reaction we've had, I need to, I realized I needed to start to present this in terms of a refutation of the outright lies. Now, if there are problems, we will discuss them. We will come to that. And yet we haven't yet got to the Talmud. We have a lot of criticisms, but uh, we're simply trying to present this in, a, in an adult manner. Now, this was said by Owen Benjamin on a stream uh, recently. If you think that they have to tell the truth you have to understand that in the Talmud, they say, let me quote it, Jews may use lies to circumvent a Gentile. That's in Baba Kama 113a. That was said by Owen Benjamin. I'm let's let's just play that, yeah. So I'm going to play this clip. It's a few seconds. If you think that they have to tell the truth, you have to understand that in the Talmud, the Jews say, let me quote it, Jews may use lies to circumvent a Gentile. That's in Baba Kama 113a. You heard that? Yep, I heard it. And so he's repeating the exact same quotes that we see everybody else repeating that they haven't, uh, uh, you know, gone and fact checked. So, you know, hopefully somebody sends uh, this to Owen Benjamin, this series. I tried to reach out to him last week. I didn't hear back. Uh, but, you know, Owen, reach out. would love to talk to you about all of this. Y anyway, go ahead, Lloyd. So I need to go through this now. This is the quick and dirty because we're not yet at the Talmud episode but I want to provide a quick and dirty rundown. The Talmud is a casebook of law amongst other things, right? Which means it's a reference manual. It is not a book that you read. It's something you study, right? Now there's a lot to be said there and I'll go into that in the next in the episode on that subject. However, it is a, also a record of debates. It is a record of discussion. Let me let, let me just interrupt you really quickly uh, as we go into this. Dashing Rogue is asking about the word goy, if there was if it's possible that the meaning of the word changed uh, over time in the Old Testament, similar to the word orgy, meaning secret meeting. I suppose now it's implied by people who, who obviously hate Jews to to be a slur. However, it's it's both its Old Testament and New Testament meanings are not pernicious. Right. One can imply anything. I guess in some sense it's become that. But really, it is just it just means from an academic point of view, it just means nations. The context is nations. If you want to imply it means animals, then provide the context, provide the statement where it shows that. But in the Bible, you notice there's not a single mention of people as animals, not one. Only as nations, as groups. I mean, I showed you there's 374 mentions as nations. There's 30 as this. There's, you know, you saw that as people. Um, you know, so there's no mention of this as animals. And we, yeah. Okay, now, unfortunately, this thing that Owen Benjamin said is completely wrong. It is 100% it is wrong. But here are my notes to explain what is actually being said all the way up here. All of this is required to explain because the Talmud is a record of debates by different legal scholars, by different rabbis who are also legal scholars, right? Now, the Mishnah is discussing, now this is what this passage is about. And he took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words out of an entire passage that is longer than this. This is, I don't know, a thousand, I don't know, whatever, a few hundred words. He's got eight words out of hundreds. And this whole passage goes on for pages. Okay. So, but the relevant section is the Mishnah. Now, sorry, 
the, the Talmud is broken into two, essentially two books, the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Mishnah is effectively a commentary on the Torah, and the Gemara is a commentary on the commentary. Now, the Mishnah is discussing a customs collector who does not, a tax collector, who does not have a limitation placed by the governor on the amount he may collect. And he collects as he pleases. Alternatively, the sages of the school of Rabbi Yanai said, the Mishnah is discussing a customs collector who stands on his own. He was not appointed by the government, but on his own. And he forces people to give him money. Now, these are conflicting, slightly diverging opinions. But the one says, look, you've got a guy who's got no limit and he's essentially robbing people. He's using his power to extort from people more than he's allowed. Or he's forcing people to give him money. So you're talking about a, a tax collector who is operating illegally. Now, it says there are those who teach that one may vow before murderers, plunderers, and customs collectors in order to, you know, obviously prevent being killed, to prevent being robbed, and prevent a customs collector from fleecing you from money he doesn't deserve. Can it be that it is permitted to pronounce such a vow before customs collectors? So it raises a question. But doesn't Shmuel say the law of the kingdom is the law? It should therefore be prohibited to state such a vow before the customs collectors. In other words, he's saying, follow the law. If the tax collector says X, you got to give him X. That is the law. The law of the kingdom is the law. And the Jews are saying, follow the legal scholars. Their rabbis are saying, follow the law. Now, the Mishnah in the Dharam issues its ruling with regards to a customs collector who does not have a limitation, right? And it goes on. Rabbi Ashi said, the Mishnah issues its ruling with regards to a Gentile collector, a Gentile customs collector to whom one may deceive. And that is where those words are taken. Right? It issues a ruling with regards to a Gentile customs collector whom one may deceive as it is taught in the case of a Jew and a Gentile who approach the court for judgment in a legal dispute. Now, Rabbi Ashi is presenting his opinion. If you can vindicate the Jew under Jewish law, vindicate him and say to the Gentile, this is our law. If he can be vindicated under Gentile law, vindicate him and say to the Gentile, this is your law. And if it is not possible to vindicate him under either system of law, one approaches the case circuitously in a roundabout manner, seeking a justification to vindicate the Jew. This is the statement of Rabbi Yishmael. So another rabbi provides an opinion. Then Rabbi Akiva, the senior, comes along. And don't forget, this discussion dates to the first century. Rabbi Akiva disagrees. And he says, one does not approach the case circuitously in order to vindicate the Jew due to the sanctification of God's name, as God's name will be desecrated if the Jewish judge employs dishonest means. Someone please let ben Owen Benjamin know that he's wrong. Because the final statement is, God's name will be desecrated if the judge employs dishonest means. Because the specific context, as it says here, is is about uh, we just uh, lost our feed hold on a second let's see what's going on here all right it's back okay so the specific context is a gentle and a jew who approach the court these are legal questions in the in the talmud you will find lots of opinions there are weak opinions there are even incorrect opinions some of it is stated deliberately as a test for the students so that they can provide their opinion to see if they know the law. Now, some idiot in the comments said here, even the best of Gentiles should be killed. That's Maimonides. Dude, first of all, it's not Maimonides. It is in the book of Exodus. Okay. In fact, it's in the Bible. That is actually in the Bible. It refers to the Egyptians. Okay. That's actually a story literally out of the Bible. So in other words, They've taken a quote of the Bible that is in the Talmud and then claim that that uh, in is the a Torah, story. you mean? But they, yeah, they're taking a story from the Torah. No, it's it's that verse is from the Torah. It is quoted in the Talmud. Oh yeah, yeah. and then it's repeated as as a desire to kill all Gentiles. No, I have that listed. I actually like I've got these notes here. Um, it is actually right here. The best of Gentiles kill. Okay, it says right here, the best of Gentiles kill. Now, I won't do this today. It's too much. But notice, I've had to write all of this nonsense to deal with that. It is in Exodus 14.7. Now, it relates to the Egyptians. 
it has got zip to do with killing Gentiles today. Understand? So seriously, seriously, grow up, grow up. If I, as a third worlder from Africa, can figure this crap out, so can you. Okay. Well, they, they have to be willing to fact check the citations. Most people are just so invested in spreading these lies and disinformation. You know, even, even you know, granted, a lot of the stuff in Judaism is bad, and we're not denying that. What we're trying to do is go through the facts and truth, figure out what is true, what isn't, figure out, you know, who the real enemy is and who isn't. And when people are, you know, constantly uh, worried, you know, that uh, the truth is being spoken, that's a big issue. And we see, you know, all these people, you know, trying to troll and whatnot. And it's just, you know, it's sad. They don't want the truth told. Why is that? Why are people afraid of primary citations that anyone can check being shown on screen so anybody can actually go through these? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, obviously, so, okay. So now to the meat of the subject. Um, so hopefully I can spend half an hour just on the subject. So I want to talk about Jewish law. So hopefully we've wrapped that up. Okay. You understand it says very clearly what the context of that statement is, and it's not in the context that Owen Benjamin used. And two, it says, no, you may not lie. It says so very clearly. Anyone can read that for themselves. Um, you know, I, I so know why, why are all of these people lying about the Talmud saying that they can lie? Isn't that the irony of it all right there? Yeah. You know, so that is in Bava Kama, that's Sephardic Bava Kama 113a, and you read from 15 to 21, passage number 15 to 21. But look, think about that. Honestly, why can't they quote the whole thing? Why can't they read the whole thing? Are they lazy? Are they fools? Are they dupes? Are they trying to create a false impression? What is right. the purpose? Yeah, what's what's the real agenda there? Why are they intentionally? It, it seems to me that it's intentional because you have so many people that no matter how many times we say these are wrong or go over them, somebody within seconds will post it up again in the chat or somewhere and act like it's the gospel truth, you know, and it's like they can't uh, admit that they are wrong. Uh, Cole Nidre will prove the African a liar. I mean, like, you know, why don't you quote your details, your evidence? You know, it's like, why uh, the African? Are you trying to call me something? Because look, I've, I've been called the N-word. I've been called a bunch of words. Joseph. Yeah, you know, they can't deal with the facts, so they have to name call. It's like, you know, and these are supposed Christians that are acting this way. And yeah. Christians are supposed to believe in truth, but clearly, uh, you know, they are not acting as Christians. So it's it's rather disturbing when people pretend and hide behind Christianity to yeah. sell their lies and their what seems to be a Islamic agenda. So look, we'll be, we will do a series. I'll go through all of these quotes, or at least a significant number of them of the best ones, and I will, I will show how they've been distorted. But hopefully that points out. Someone please let Owen Benjamin know he needs to yeah. uh, walk back his Fibon statement. Fibonacci, we already showed his quotes on screen, and he's only quoting the same uh, Talmud quotes. And again, I don't know if, if people are, you know, maybe their IQs are only in the 90s or something, but this episode isn't about the Talmud yet. And we already stated that, that we will be going through the Talmud quotes. But I'm going to say this one last time. You have to read the passages surrounding and the words surrounding in context, in context, Fibonacci, try to grasp the meaning. Don't just keep quoting one line when there's five or 10 pages in context. I, you know, I mean, it's, it's really not that hard to yeah. grasp these okay, things. So, so, okay, so let's try not to focus on the comments and continue learning yeah. for the evening. Okay, so yeah, actually, so he's right. Yes, you are correct. Thank you for that. Okay, now the Jewish law, the Torah, the law of Moses. Now the Torah, within the context, could mean the entire Bible. It also typically refers to the first five books of Moses, right? Also called the Tanakh, in Greek, the Pentateuch, and the written law. Now, the Jewish law, now, the first year of the Jewish calendar starts in 1HH, Haloach Haivri, which is, for us, 2761 BC, where, according to Jewish tradition, the world was created. So the subject matter in the Bible covers a span of 5,779 years in 2019 and counting. Now, the Hebrew word Torah means teaching, 
or instruction or law dependent on context. Now, what the Christians call the Old Testament is the written Torah. The written Torah is what God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, and Moses wrote this down. Now, the Talmud is where you would find what is called rabbinic Judaism. Right? That's a subject for another day. Now, the Hebrew scriptures known to most non-Jews is the Tanakh, which is an acronym for the Torah or the teaching, which refers in this context to the five books of Moses from Genesis to Deuteronomy, the Nevi'im or the prophets, and the Ketuvim or Kesuvim, the writings. Now, the Jewish world uses the term Torah in reference to rabbinic instruction, right? Now, within the, obviously, these books of Moses, the first five books of Moses contain the Ten Commandments. And there are a total, if you read through all the books and count them up, 613 commandments. Now, Moses received these in the Tanakh, and they're called mitzvot, plural, and mitzvah, singular. I read through every single commandment, just by the way. I got a list and read every single one. Now, Genesis in particular is an argument against worldviews that the Torah considers pagan, inhuman, and wrong. These were examples of tribes who were engaging in child sacrifice and incest. And after hundreds of years of God speaking to them, sending prophets, and these tribes not listening, God decided to destroy the world. Now, the Torah includes no sacrifices to dead ancestors, and seeking the spirits of the dead is explicitly forbidden, which were common practices amongst idolaters in the day. Now, uh, these are in Canaan, Maimonides, Moses Maimonides was the preeminent Jewish scholar, and he created a canonical list of the 613 commandments. Here are a few. To know, yes? I just wanted to say, uh, Liam Converse says, saying Moses was a Jew is a lie. Um, Jesus was a Martian, sure. So, to know that there is a God, first one. Not to even think that there are other gods besides him. To know that God is one. Notice Islam adopted that and went ape with it. It's called the Tawhid. And we are idolaters because we believe in Christians in three gods. To love God, fear God, sanctify God's name. Do not profane God's name. Do not use his name for evil. Do not destroy objects associated with God's name. Notice that Islam does this. Those churches they destroyed, I showed you earlier. Listen to prophets speaking in God's name. Do not try the Lord unduly. Emulate God's ways and cleave to those who know God. These are the first few of the laws of Moses. These are the foundation. Remember I said that the Old Testament forms the foundation upon which the Talmud is based. So the Mishnah is the commentary and the exegesis of the Old Testament of the laws of Moses. And the Gemara is the commentary on that commentary. Now, treatment of Gentiles. Love the stranger, Deuteronomy 10, 19. Love your neighbor. Do not cheat a stranger monetarily in buying or selling, Exodus 22, verse 20. Do not insult or harm a stranger with words. Do not oppress the weak. This would be orphans, widows, and old people. Do not speak derogatorily of others. Do not insult or harm anybody with words. Deuteronomy 10, 19. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 32. And if a stranger travels with thee in your land, you shall do him no wrong. The stranger that travels with you shall be unto you as the homeborn among you, and you shall love him as thyself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. These are the instructions of God to the Jews. And a stranger shalt thou not wrong. Just repetition. Thou shalt not vex a stranger nor oppress him. This is the written law of God given to Moses and the foundation of Jewish law. Now, Exodus twenty-two twenty-one: Do not mistreat or oppress. You shall do no wrong to a stranger. You shall not wrong. Now, it also says here, in this version of the Bible, you must not exploit a foreign resident nor oppress him. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. Okay? So, Jews are told, do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. They are to respect life and they respect the lives of their strangers of strangers amongst them do not take revenge this is very clear do not take revenge to honor those that's leviticus 19 18 now this quote here to honor those who teach and know the torah leviticus 19 32 this is a point of potential departure with rabbinic judaism where the you had different sects that were vying for political control um in ancient um well in the past 
And the Pharisees eventually managed to seize control of Judaism, both political and religious control. And they, I think this is a case where one can start to see, once we get into this in later episodes, how they made a departure from the written law and how they imposed themselves. They, they gave themselves honors they did not deserve. They became prideful. They started to refer to themselves as princes and kings and gave themselves honors they may not have deserved. Idolatrous practices, another chapter. Do not pass your child through the fire to Moloch, Leviticus 18.21. Jews were the first of the nations to abolish child sacrifice. Within the Old Testament, this was a common practice. And then the Jews were given these laws, these moral laws by God. And Judaism explicitly forbids child sacrifice. Now, notice in, in Ab Abraham was asked to the story of the sacrifice of Abraham's son. Abraham, if you read the original Hebrew, he was asked to prepare his son. Not to sacrifice. The word is prepare. This was a test. And also God requested. I should make a capital. God requested it. God did not demand. Abraham is said to have faith that God had no intention of sacrificing his son. Because in Genesis 22 verse 5, Abraham says to his servants, stay here with the ass. The boy and I will go up there. We will worship and we will return to you. Now, Greek and Latin sources also speak of the offerings of children by fire as sacrifices in Carthage, the Phoenician colony. Plutarchus, Diodorus Siculus, and Plutarch all mention burning of children as offerings to Cronus or Saturn. Saturn is Baal Hamon, the chief god of Carthage. Baal Hamon is also, has multiple names, but Baal, I think, should be obvious. And also you have Hubal, which is the proper name of Allah. And I want to make a point here. Notice that when a Muslim shouts, Allahu Akbar, and then kills someone on the street, right, in sudden jihad syndrome, notice Allahu Akbar means God is greater than your God. The implication, God is greater. The old Arabic would mean God is bigger, literally bigger, as in it used to be a rock idol, and it was the largest of them. But God is greater than your God. But notice he's killing in the name of his God. He's both killing and being killed. And also when people, Arabs from places like Palestine, sacrifice their children, they're doing so in the name of Allah. They're sacrificing their children in the name of Baal. Moving on. So Psalms 106, 37, 38. They sacrifice their sons and their daughters to false gods. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was desecrated by their blood. So ultimately, God commanded the Jews to destroy the Canaanites after 400 years of, of idolatry, child sacrifice, murder, and incest. God said that they need to kill the Jews. Sorry, the Jews have to kill the Canaanites because they've defiled the land. Now, Deuteronomy 13.13, 13, do not bring an individual to idol worship. Jews are not to bring anyone to idol worship. Now, this obviously has theological implications for Christians because... According to rabbinic tradition, at least, worshiping Jesus could be seen to be idol worship or a man that has no deity. So those are questions we'll tackle in a later episode. But notice this in Deuteronomy 13. Troublemakers have arisen among you and have led the people astray, saying, let us go and worship other gods, gods you have not known. Certain men, of, certain men the children of Belial, have withdrawn the inhabitants of the city, saying, let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. Meaning that there is always the risk of infiltration, that people would infiltrate and try to subvert people that are meant to be holy. Keep that in mind. The same is mentioned by Paul and Peter in the New Testament. Now, notice that Belial, or Belial for the Greek, means without a master. It appears 26 times in the Old Testament. It is described as a people that are characterized by worthlessness or corruption, a personification of evil, not an actual entity. There's a less accepted theory that Belial comes from Belial, meaning without a yoke, which would mean someone who is lawless and rebellious, someone who doesn't have discipline, shall we say, who is carnal and of the flesh, who is unrestrained by law or morality. Notice what Jan said earlier about do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. This is defined as evil. This is defined as effectively satanic within the Old Testament as well as the New Testament interpretation of that. 
Later, the personification began to be thought of as an actual person, and the New Testament Belial is used as a proper name of Satan. So that's in 2 Corinthians 6.15, what accord has Christ with Belial. Now, that means that do what thou wilt would then be defined as explicitly satanic. There's the Acidic Book of Jubilees who say Belial was one of the angels who followed Satan in his fall. Topic. Magic. I, I'm just going to say one thing really quickly, and then I'm going to ban this individual because they can't grasp it. This episode is about the Torah. I've said this maybe 10 or 15 times in the chat, and we've said this on the show here. This episode is about the Torah, which is the Old Testament. We're not discussing the Talmud yet. I know, Fibonacci, you're, you're really struggling there with the brain power. So uh, in a couple weeks, the episode will be about the Talmud. We're not avoiding it. This episode is about the Torah or the Old Testament. I know this is really hard for you to grasp such a difficult concept. We're not avoiding your citations. We will cover them. Try to get it into your head and realize that this is about the Torah. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Now, magic. Jews are not meant to alter reality with magic or pretend they have magic powers as commanded by the Torah. Now, it says in Leviticus, do not perform as a medium. Do not perform as a magical seer. Do not go into trances to foresee events in Deuteronomy 18 verse 10. Do not engage in divination or soothsaying, Leviticus 19, 26. Do not mutter incantations. That's another issue that one could have with rabbinical Judaism in that they have, instead of free form prayer, which was the norm prior to them taking political and religious control, they have created these repetitive incantations effectively. Mm. But we have to go into detail to discuss all of those specifics. Do not attempt to contact the dead. Do not consult mediums or magical seers. And do not perform acts of magic. Now, magic is the opposite of truth. And truth is the opposite of magic. Truth is conforming your will to reality. Whereas magic is attempting to conform reality to your will. Now, Note that there is, and I will have to get to this, do more work on this, but there is a Jewish form of astrology that the rabbis apparently practice. Apparently, it's not the full form of astrology as we know it, but um, there are discussions, for instance, in Talmud Shabbat 156a, there are discussions on astrology. Now, again, the rabbis don't agree. Rabbi Hanina says, a constellation makes one wise and a constellation makes one wealthy, and there's a constellation for the Jewish people that influences them. Rabbi Yohanan says there's no consolation for the Jewish people that influences them. Even the rabbis don't agree. The Jewish people are not subject to the influence of astrology. So notice, I could have said the first one and left out the second one, and you would have said yes, or I could have quoted the second one and not the first one, and you would have said no. Now he says, thus said the Lord, learn not the way of the nations. That would be the other nations, the idolatrous nations like Canaan and um, so on. The nations will be dismayed by them, but not by the Jewish people. So, And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the nations are dismayed at the signs of heaven. That's Jeremiah 10. The nations will be dismayed by them, but not the Jewish people. The Bible then says, "Let this is not your concern. Now, one who was born under the influence of Saturn will be a man whose thoughts are for naught, and some blah, blah, blah. So Rabbi Yitzhak says, in this context means just in the performance of mitzvot. So they... There's a discussion. Now, this discussion, again, goes on for pages, okay? Just to let you know that there is a discussion with a variety of conflicting and disagreeing opinions. One who was born under the influence of Mars will be one who spills blood. Rav Ashi said, it'll either be a blood letter or a thief or a slaughter of animals or a circumciser. Rabbi Rabbah says, I was born under the influence of Mars and I do not perform any of those activities. So there you have this disagreement. This is a discussion by these rabbis. And the one says yes, and the one says no, because you don't always find any conclusions in the Talmud. So now what is taken, though, is that often the term spills blood is considered not literally, but metaphorically. So that may well be a metaphorical meaning. Now it goes on to say, do not eat a limb torn off a living creature in Deuteronomy. Do not eat blood. This is not allowed. And this accounts for Christians and Jews. Do not swear falsely in God's name. Do not take God's name in vain. Do not swear in God's name to confirm the truth. 
okay, of swearing God's name to confirm the truth when deemed necessary in court. This harks back to that first quote that I gave with Owen Benjamin, that Jews must tell the truth in court. All right? Send the impure from the temple. Well, Jesus did that, right? Fulfill what was uttered and do what was promised, right? Do not kill the murderer before he stands trial. Numbers 35, 12. This is an instruction. They must. Now, don't forget the seventh law of Noah was to establish courts of justice to fulfill these laws. Now, um, the guy that you banned a few minutes ago, he was insisting, oh, well, it's these five laws. Oh, my gosh. No, it's all the law. The law that we call the law today in the Western world. And notice here, do not overcharge or underpay for an article. Jews are not to overcharge people and they're not to underpay. They, they should not be swindled. And they should save someone being pursued even by taking the life of the pursuer. They need to protect people even if they have to kill someone who's trying to harm an innocent person. These again fly in the face of all of these claims, these assertions that are made about the supposed Talmudic rules, and the Talmud is effectively based upon this. And, yes, and just is. really quickly, Lloyd, you know, the, the Talmud is not a religious book, it's a legal or a law book. And people right. think that it's the you know, it's a religious text, but it's discussions of like judges and lawyers over court situations and things like that and right. just you know breakdowns of all of the arguments and so Correct. you know citing one line out of context of a whole argument isn't how the talmud you know works yeah those quotes might be in the talmud but you have to understand the context that they are uh, pro yeah. you know provided there and and that seems to be uh, you know tough for a lot of people to understand yeah i agreed now wages and salaries Pay wages on the day they were earned. Pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and counting on it, or you will be guilty of sin. Do not delay payment of wages past the agreed time. The hired worker may eat from the unharvested crops where he works. Deuteronomy 23, 25. The worker must not eat while on hired time. and The worker must not take more than he can eat. Right? These are rules that Jews have to live by. Now, you get your Karaite Jews who live purely according to this. And the Sadducees were a group that refused the oral law or the Talmudic law. And they simply went with these laws, the laws of Moses. Now, notice here, it says, do not lend with interest. But this would be in reference to other Jews. Do not borrow with interest. Although Jews are allowed, according to, that's the word of God, to loan to Gentiles with interest. And this also leads us, if we get into this discussion in the future, as to how they became bankers, because usury or simply interest on loans was not allowed for, for Christians. The church wouldn't allow it. The governments didn't allow it back in the day. And the Jews were the only one who could do so. And therefore, they stepped into that role. There was a vacuum. They stepped into that role because they were allowed to do that. And they set up the banks eventually and became very good at it, simply because there was a religious prohibition against it in Europe. Right? Now, you could, it says you can lend to and borrow from idolaters with interest. That's Deuteronomy 23, 21. Now, a lot of these criticisms that people make of the Talmud check because a lot of the time it references the Old Testament. Now, if you're a Christian, then you also happen to follow the Bible and it's in the Bible. It's the word of God. So if you have a problem, do give God a phone call and tell him, look, dude, I think you're wrong. Now, here's a couple of things that are important. Do not add to the Torah commandments or their oral explanations. Now, we'd have to do an entire episode on the departure from the written to the oral law by the rabbis within Talmudic Judaism or rabbinic Judaism. That is something that's, that, that's, that's a good two-hour discussion right there. But Because one can say that they've added to the Torah commandments with oral explanations because one can argue very, very clearly and very seriously that there is no such thing as the oral law, that Moses never received it. There's lots of reasons for that. Now, surely there's someone will have an argument on their side, but um, one can make a very clear argument. There is no oral law. Then, not to diminish from the Torah any commandments in whole or in part, and one can say that the rabbis have done this. Now, a couple of examples of Jewish law versus Islamic law. We did that. The laws of the captive woman. We did that previously in the last episode. Very, very different. In um, Islamic law, captured woman, raper, Bob's your uncle. Not so in Judaism. You may not sell her into slavery, where she's automatically a slave if she's captured, and her marriage becomes annulled. And in Islam, yeah, Islam, right? And you may not retain her for servitude after having sex with her, 
but there's a whole process again we discussed that this is the read deuteronomy 21 verse 11 okay up to 14 read deuteronomy 21 to 14 to get that and you'll see that's the old testament rule now don't forget a lot of the old testament stuff is no longer valid today there was a new commandment because some covenants yeah the new covenant called the new testament in fact correct a lot of the old laws have faded away the covenants were often for a particular place time and a people so often so last week we quoted something as well which was a covenant specific to a time and a place and a people whereas that covenant is now past because that person is gone so the torah means teaching or instruction okay but so genesis the book of genesis means the book of creation exodus means exit leaving leviticus means relating to the levites and those were the, were the original priests of the jewish temple Right, the rabbis took over that function because once the temple was destroyed, once the Romans destroyed the temple, the Levites were they didn't have any function. And the rabbis stepped in and said, Well, we have a vision for the Jews, and they imposed their their vision onto the Jewish culture and have held that that sway for two thousand years. Deuteronomy means the second law. Now the Talmud holds that the oral Torah is written by Moses, with the exception of the last eight verses of Deuteronomy which describe his death and burial, those were written by Joshua. Now, according to tradition, the Torah was recompiled by Ezra the scribe during the second temple period. So there's a covenant from God to the Jews. There are multiple covenants. There are more than one page that covers that. But in Sinai, God made a covenant with the Jews, and none other than the Jews were compelled. This was specific to the Jews. In Deuteronomy 9, the Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself. He has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. Prophetic words, if I say so myself. So the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. and they So there are, according to God's word, at least in the Old Testament, that there are a chosen people and a holy people. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity. Now, they are meant to prosper. According to this. Now, if we are criticizing people for prosperity, then we are violating again the 10th commandment. I spoke last week about the violations of the first three commandments. This would then be the 10th, which would be to covet others' possessions. And it says also, you will abound in prosperity within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. Now, don't forget, I quoted about eight passages from, from the Quran, which says that God gives Israel to the Jews. And here as well, within the Old Testament, this is the land given to the Jews. So, you know, there's the, there's both these books claim that this land is given to the Jews. The Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give you the rain to your land and so on. Okay. You shall lend. Notice, you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Deuteronomy 9 verse 12. You shall, sorry, Deuteronomy 28 verse 12. You shall lend to many nations. It says here, point blank in the Bible, since being the, well, that the Jews will lend. Money yeah, to and nations. here's here's the wow. usury that the Jews use against other nations. So there that is right there. Obviously, that's not cool, but there it is in the Bible. But don't forget they were permitted to have, to charge interest when lending money to Gentiles. That That is biblical. I mean, that I just read that earlier. That is biblical. So you shall only go up and not down if you obey the commands of the Lord. When we get into the Talmud, this will get really interesting. There's some fascinating details there, but you shall only go up and not down if you obey the commands of the Lord. Right? Is there Liam is as saying there's absolutely nothing in the Torah that says the Jews are God's chosen people, but it's commonplace in mainstream Zionist Christianity. I just read it to you. There's more than one verse. This is just one. There's plenty. The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself. I gave you a quote earlier, Jan. Do you remember what it was? No, I don't. Sorry. There's been a lot of quotes tonight. <laughs> was it Deuteronomy 14 verse 2? Uh, yeah, that's probably it. Let me pull that up here. Um, Deuteronomy 14 verse 2. I'm just going to the very first link I come to. I have it already open here. Thou art a holy Did people you? unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a particular people unto himself unto all the nations here let me just share this let me uh, i have to for you are a people yeah holy. I, I've, i'm you showing it on god. screen there too yeah it is you the lord has chosen out of all the people on the earth to be his people his treasured possession 
Do you have anything else to say, Liam? Yeah, obviously not, Liam, but thank you for that. Um, he said he was speaking to the Israelites and not the Jews. That may be true, but that's a different discussion. But, you know, it's like, you know, people need to try to distinguish who the Jews follow the Torah. And then you have atheists that are called Jews when technically it's a religion. Then you have you know, uh, rabbinical Judaism, which follows the Talmud, and all of these get clumped together. Try to be, you know, more specific in your attacks, and, you know, rather than just beating Jew drum, Jew, 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 it gets, you know, monotonous and ridiculous. We're trying to educate people what the texts actually say themselves, you know, so if you focus on the actual text, you'll see that, you know, those who are like Revelation 3, 9, those who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. So keyword and or keywords and are not, but do lie. So if they are not Jews and they are lying and claiming to be Jews, then maybe they aren't Jews and they are lying. So then why are people continually calling them Jews? And he's like, and he says, uh, I am not the one saying that the Jews are God's chosen people. I mean, we just freaking read it right out of Deuteronomy 14 too. So, I mean, it's like, you got to beat your head against a wall at some point there, you know, at some point people are just not, you know, penetrable yeah. in accepting, um, you know, yeah. look, primary citations. Have, um, look, obviously we have the wrong Bible. We're using the goy friendly Bible. Yeah. And, and the wrong Talmud and they won't show us which Talmud they got these citations from, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this, so obviously we, so we we're going through the the Old Testament as it relates to the Jews, and then the New Testament. People have based see. a lot of the argument, and they the see they want to call me a Mormon. It's all this dis, de, detraction from away from the facts. You know they can't focus on the citation, so they have to attack us, call us Mormons, yeah. call us monkeys, call it you black, call you African, call it all this stuff. This is obviously another one of uh, no. HT's fake accounts. So. You know, it just worry, goes uh, on and on and on and on and on with the, no, no, you know, with the attacks. Let's, let's move on. I mean, th the point is they're trying to shut this down and they're succeeding if we give it time. So in Exodus 19, verse 4 to 6, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Again, preferential, right? God himself says. Now, so they have a covenant to keep, and one could then start to argue that maybe they, through the rabbis, who then seize political and religious control of the Jews, they have not fulfilled their covenant. But that's, but that's an argument that needs to be made in detail. Notice there's a law that says um, the rebellious son, right? The, the Torah basically says that a child is stoned to death for not listening to his parents and for eating meat and blah, blah, blah. But no kids get stoned to death. I know in which religion children do get killed. That's called honor killings. Anybody want to take a wild guess which one? Uh, Islam. Hindu, not Judaism. Yeah. Okay. Now I will move into the next section. I don't think we're going to finish this today. We'll have to come back to this, um, but it is a fairly lengthy. And then from there, we can step in straight into the Talmud on the next session. But rabbinic Judaism, one could say is a departure from the written law. Right now, our first example is Jesus in Mark 7. So this is the transition from the written law of the Torah into the oral law of the Talmud and of the rabbis. Example one, Jesus in Mark 7. And the Pharisees and some of the scribes, this is probably the last one I'll do, Jan. I will, I will do this and then finish up today. So this is human traditions and God's commandments. The Pharisees saw that some of Jesus' disciples were eating their bread with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands ritually, thus holding fast to the traditions of the elders. Not God's law, traditions of the elders. And there are many other traditions which they have received and hold fast to. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with unclean hands? And he said to them, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites, as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far, far away from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Abandoning the commandments of God, you hold fast to the traditions of men. 
you splendidly ignore the commandments of God so that you can keep your tradition. That's a criticism by Jesus to the Pharisees. Now, here's where we step into the Talmud. Right? Because now we, we, we're doing a switch from the Old Testament into the Talmud. Now, Rabbi Bar Avin says that another rabbi said the obligation of washing hands before eating non-sacred food is due to blah, blah, blah. And here again, before eating bread, they have to wash their hands with proper water before eating bread. And the right amount is a quarter of a log. Now, if you read this, if you read these passages, and I've got the links here, it is endless. Endless. It goes on for pages, right? Read it. They talk about you have to wash your hands before eating bread. There's several references now here. Before eating bread with a quarter log of water, wash your hands. Wash your hands before eating bread. They had all these rules and rules and rules. The rabbis introduced rule after rule after rule after rule, right? Which were not in the law of Moses, which were not in the Old Testament. So now, for instance, they'd say, look, you've got to wash your hands. But what if you dip one hand in halfway and then pull it out? Is the water one quarter dirty? Can you put that hand back? Is the water fully dirty or quarter dirty? What if you put that hand back in? What if you put the other hand back in? Do you have to wash? Do you have to get fresh water? What if you put the one hand in all the way and then pull it out? Is it like half dirty or is it fully dirty? What if you put one hand in before the other? What, do you have to put both hands in? On, and what if someone else wants to wash his hands? In? Believe me, they ask every possible inane permutation of the question. Okay, and it just goes on and on to the finest, most inane detail. And this is just characteristic of the Talmud. They, 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 yeah. I was just going to say, Liam is saying that we took uh, one Bible verse out of context and misapplied it to a different group of people. I just provided three different Bible well, verses. Well, he's saying, you know, some are are Hebrews yeah. versus Israelites versus Jews, so... You know, that's, you know, that's what he's going uh, off on now and trying to say that we're misrepresenting it. If he can provide us with the Bible that he uses, maybe, but th that's a different discussion. So notice, okay, now, so these are all Talmudic quotes, right, um, about washing your hands before eating bread. That was a rabbinic So I, I guess uh, if the Talmud says that washing your hands before you eat is bad, does that mean washing your hands before you eat is evil? No, no, no. It says you have to. You should wash your hands before washing. No, but I mean, but like, because, you know, people say oh, that the Talmud is evil. So if you wash your hands before you eat, is that evil? Yes. Yes. So notice, now, this discussion of bread, now, this is just one paragraph from each discussion. This goes on for pages, right? Look at this. This is just discussions about washing your hands before eating bread. But this is from the Talmud, so that has to mean that it's, that it's evil. It. Right, yeah. This is just a fraction of it, okay? It just goes on forever, okay? And they ask, is the water half pure if two Do you people wanna, share? Why don't you people? click the link into the uh, actual Talmud so people can see the length of the discussion there? So on... Let me go there. So it comes up. This is just one example. Okay, this is just one example here. eating, uh, washing your hands before you eat, apparently, because the Talmud is evil, that would make washing your hands before you eat evil. <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, look, it goes on forever. And it's in different sections. Now, the conversations are not necessarily contiguous, they might start it, they might start talking about washing your hands, right? Then they'll suddenly talk about horses. Then they'll suddenly start talking about baskets. Then they'll talk about wine. And then they'll go back to in a different chapter, they'll start talking about washing hands again. So it just, it's just, it's just not, you know, it's all over the place sometimes. It's nuts when you read it. It's, I've been reading it for weeks now. <laughs> Some of it's really weird, man. <laughs> so anyway, so there's questions about, are your hands half pure if two people share water men for one? So if two people share water men for one, are your hands half pure or are your hands pure? You know, it's like they raise every possible permutation of the problem and, and they go through it Oh God, you fall, you want to fall asleep? Read this stuff, okay? So uh, it is hysterical. For instance, there's a discussion about bread. Okay, I'm bringing the citation up. This is a discussion about bread. This is just one paragraph. It goes on forever. Didn't you say one may not need? That contradicts the statement that they agree that it's permitted to stir the dough. This is not difficult. I and mean, it goes on and it talks about 
What if it's a thick mixture? What if it's a thin mixture? What if it's soft? What if it's got too much water, too little water? How do you, do you pull it? Do you push it? Do you pump it? Do you rip it? Do you, oh God, it just goes on. Trust me, they, they, the Talmud is not only about, <laughs> it's got some of the, oh, read it. Just read it. The, this is Shabbat 156A2, okay? On safari.org. I mean, man, it just goes on forever. Now, okay, the next example, Jesus heals a woman on the Sabbath, right? He was teaching in one of the synagogues and the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed a woman on the Sabbath day. And he said, there are six days in which men ought to work. This is Luke 13 verses 10 to 7, right? Jesus heals a woman on the Sabbath. <clears throat> the Lord answered them and said, thou hypocrite, doth not each of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the store and lead him away to watering? Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And when he said these things, his adversaries were ashamed. So he is not saying that, so he's saying these are your rules as the, at that time, the rabbis, as the Pharisees, rather. These are not the laws of God. These are not the laws in, in the Bible or the Old Testament or Moses. These are your, and I have one more example. Um, so again, a man suffering from edema is healed, and he says, who among you, if your son or your ox falls into a well on the day of the Sabbath, will not immediately pull him out? And they were not able to make a reply. Now, in this example, the Pharisees are, he says, implying, elevating animals above people, even above Jews, because Jesus is helping Jews. And they're saying that, look, you can't do this. They're willing to work on the Sabbath to preserve animals, but not help people so he was calling them hypocrites so here are the first criticisms of jesus about the pharisees and about how they are starting to distort the religion yeah uh robert marley wants to know who are your people as if we didn't already discuss this and why do you advocate for jews do you think they need help bringing information to the world and have you done this for your people, black man, wake the fuck up. This is the low IQ type of stuff. You can't discuss primary citations um, if you're addressing primary citations and everyone's lies. Well, you know. well Robert Molly, um, people have been posting quotes about the Talmud, and I investigated them, and every single one that I checked turned out to be false. And we are thus doing this to determine what the facts are. We're laying the groundwork so we can explore the Talmud. We're now doing the transition from the Old Testament, the Mosaic law, into the Talmudic law, the oral law. Now, and, and obviously, all of these insults are designed to stop me from embarrassing the liars who are out there spreading lies because it's not about defending the Talmud. It's trying to find out what are the facts, what is the truth. These are primary citations. Your friends and you and everyone else are posting falsified statements, are lying blatantly. And I think you are trying to save yourself and all your friends from absolute embarrassment for not checking their facts and for just being out and out liars. And that's very well said. And, you know, it's with all of their childish insults, et cetera, um, you know, it's clear that they have an agenda to protect and it's clear that they are very afraid of of this information getting out. I mean, uh, you know, all of these people who spread these lies, you know, their gig is up, you know, and, and they have to smash the, the thumbs down and they have to suppress this work because they only have one agenda and that's to lie. They don't want anyone fact checking. And, yeah. you know, so now people are going to know the truth of all of this, and they're going to know that these people are liars. I mean, you know, uh, you know, this person, uh, Holly Beth, is saying I'm anti-Logos because we are showing the primary citations from the Bible and the Talmud and everything on screen. And what does Logos mean? But truth, logic, reason, the word, etc. And so somehow, in their in their twisted, delusional way, they actually think that sharing the truth is anti-Logos. Yeah. when it means truth itself. So I'm going to do one more just to finish off based on a comment I saw there that the Jews are race supremacists. Now, um, so I'll leave that there and we'll pick that, that up next week, Jan, if you don't mind. But for instance, I want to read to you a final statement from me. It says in Deuteronomy, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. God, God himself in the Bible 
calls the Jews a holy people, holy to him, right? Now, of course, there's a change in the New Testament, and we'll get into that in the future. But I want to read from the Quran, right? The Quran, sorry. 98, right, which is called the clear evidence. The, the chapter is called Al-Bayina, the clear evidence, 98, verse 6 to 8. The pictorial version, lo, those who disbelieve amongst the people of the scripture, that would mean Jews and Christians, will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of created beings. They are the worst of creatures. They are the worst of men. They are the worst of the creatures. There's a translation that uses the worst of beasts. When you take the Arabic and you translate it, it says they are the evil of the wilderness. Okay, that is what the Quran says, that Jews and Christians are the evil of the wilderness. We are the worst of beasts, the worst of creatures, the worst of men. But it's okay because it's only a small minority of 1.7 billion people that are saying it. So that's fine. Now, notice this is from what's called the word for word meaning of the Quran. It's an Islamic book. I shall click on this. And it says here, the worst evil and wicked. Okay, it says that we as non-Muslims are the worst. We are evil and wicked. This is the book. I'll just show you a word for word meaning of the Quran, volume three by Muhammad Muhar Ali. So heck, look it up yourself. Now, so it says here that worst of creatures, right? Creatures. So we are the worst. We are evil. We are wicked. We are the evil. We are the evil of creation. We are the worst. We are the most evil. We are the most wicked. Therefore, it is mercy for Muslims to kill the Jews and the Christians because we are evil. They are doing God a service, right? Allah a service. Now, this is from another book called the Quran Word by Word, which discusses Surah 98, the clear evidence. And this is clear evidence to Muslims, right, from the Quran, that we are the worst of creatures. Of course, it goes on to say, those who believe, the Muslims, are the best of created beings. They are the best of men. They are the best of the righteous. Now, I know you've said lots of wonderful things about the Talmud in the past, and you've heard them. Well, how come it's okay when the Quran says the same and worse? How come when I look in the Talmud, I can't find these statements, but I can find them in the Quran, but it's okay? Because 1.7 billion people is a small minority, and they can say what they like. So answer me that. I'll leave it at that, Tim. That's me. All right. Well, we've gone over all the evidence, and uh, we're apparently we're selling Jewish lies and neocon deceits, and uh, people aren't capable of looking up primary citations. They have to resort to name, uh, sandbox name calling, and this kind of stuff. So. You gave almost two hours of primary citations for anyone with a you know ninety five or higher IQ that you know that for them to fact check. So, um, oh, this is another video which I intend to debunk from activist news. I mean, sorry, debunk the Bible. I'm sorry, you know, like, do, do you have a different Bible I should use? Yeah, you know, it's just, um, yeah, it's always the insults, it's always the distraction, it's always uh, name calling and everything, and they can't. They can't, they refuse to deal with the citations. They have to lie about the citations and the evidence that we've given, and they have yeah. to name call on, at us. They have their whole agenda riding on all of our work presented here being false. And of course, they won't go line by line showing how it's fake. They'll go through like Activist News did and misrepresent everything that we've presented and lie well, about the I'm citations and everything. Like, for a man who's like dead on accurate, where, where did I say I'm an activist? I'm an ex-Muslim. And he said that I'm Iran hating. I quoted from the opening chapter of the Iranian constitution that says they must make jihad on the entire world in the name of Allah. Right. That, that, I just quoted from what's in their constitution. Right. Look, it's, if you're killed by a Muslim in the name of jihad, you're being killed by a small minority that makes it fine. You know, their whole gig is up because they're being totally exposed as frauds. And all of these primary citations, you know, they cannot deal with them. So they have to name call. They have to make up hit piece videos like Activist News did. And they have to flat out lie about all of the things we said. They won't go you know, line by line and present it accurately. They won't check the citations. They have to keep their lie up because, you know, otherwise everyone's going to know that they've been frauds and selling 
selling falsehoods, you know, and it's like, you know, what they want to do is confuse, uh, you know, Israeli tactics, which are 80% atheists, for instance, with uh, Torah believing Jews, with rabbinical Judaism, with Sabbatean Judaism, etc. They want to clump it all together and then pretend like it's one group of people rather than distinguishing specifically who is whom. Uh, we showed at the beginning of this how much is actually being done by Islam as a bait and switch, etc. And so then, you know, it's, it's based on all of these, uh, you know, misrepresentations. And, you know, and we don't need to debate activist news. Anybody can watch our presentations and all of the fact-checked on-screen citations. Anyone can go through and fact-check that versus the obvious distortions and lies and name-calling that these people promote. I mean, it's, it's, it's in your face. So uh, we welcome anyone to go through and fact-check line by line. You know, don't quote one line out of the Talmud and take it out of the context of the surrounding paragraphs. Look at the full paragraphs and the full discussion. It's clearly legalese between lawyers, etc. So, uh, you know, that's what it isn't that what Logos shows? Uh, no, Logos deals with truth. I don't need to go debate people who are clearly lying and distorting our research. That's stupid. So, um, you know, it, it, how about, you know, if, if uh, Activist News wants to go actually line by line and present the research accurately without lying, then that would be one thing. But uh, they don't want to do that. They have a gig and it's, you know, uh, spread as much hate and disinformation about the Jews at all costs and, you know, damn the truth. Uh, protect Islam, you know, never mind that all of these points we've, you know, that they're saying about Judaism, you can openly and easily find in Islam. And they don't care about that, you know. And, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, so why the sole focus? You know, we first we expose Islam. Now we're, we are going to expose some bad things in Judaism as well. You know, like well, someone said, it's not distortions. Having a debate is healthy. Look, Owen Benjamin says to 275,000 people, the Jews say that they can lie to you. It takes me an hour to read through that book and then type up those notes and double check everything and try to find, you know, other stuff. So, so someone can say eight words in two seconds and it takes me forever to go and verify. So no, if someone is going to casually lie, make statements that are just rhetoric, it, no. Right. No, and, and another probably, thing is, is what they'll, think. what they'll do is we'll cite the primary citations and show the facts on screen. And then they'll pull up a second or third hand citation and say, see, see, see your second or third hand citation or your primary citation is refuted by the second or third hand citation. You know, we have to go by the primaries. Who's Michael the Hoffman is a Spain. 4,000 of them were killed in Spain in one day. You might recall I spoke about that. Right. You know, and Michael Hoffman, this folks, is, this is a secondhand citation. He does not refute a primary citation. You have to check Hoffman's citations as well. I have Hoffman's work right here. You know, okay, and so Jews admit that masonry is Kabbalah. Okay, so we already showed how masonry was tied to Islam. Parts, Hold I didn't talk about Iranians. I said the Iranian constitution says that they need to make ready steeds of war against the whole world and spread jihad to the entire world. That's in their constitution. And, and here, that. Jews admit that masonry is Kabbalah, except as we exposed at the beginning of the show, uh, masonry, is, masonry is heavily tied to Islam. And not only that, Kabbalah is probably related to Kaaba, which is, by the way, in Mecca, the Kaaba stone. And uh, that's a whole other discussion for another There's time. There's some fascinating things there too. So yeah. Yeah, you know, but hey, it, it doesn't. You know, when you look at these facts, it doesn't. Uh, you know, it doesn't go with the beating the uh, Jew drum. And you know, I've I've done that before as well. I've looked at all of that stuff as well. What about Jewish eugenics? And see, they go on and on. They have to constantly change the goalpost and bring up anything outside. Okay, how much of this is really Jewish eugenics? How much of it is atheist eugenics? How much of it is Huxleyan eugenics? How much of it is, you know, uh, not Torah-believing Jews? Yeah. Notice yeah. this is rhetoric. This is not dialectic. Yep. Notice I'm using sources. I don't go very long before I quote where it came from, what it is, and I'm presenting evidence. But someone says, Jews eat children. Like, is that an argument? No, that's not an argument. Right. 
You know, uh, and uh, beating tracks out of Babylon says uh, Kab Allah, Kaaba Allah, uh, Kabbalah, oh, which is actually you know, Kab Allah, Kab Allah. Yes, exactly. Think about it. So, and the Kaaba, that's the black Kaaba stone, the the supposed moon rock or whatever it is, the idol worship in uh, Mecca. And so, uh, you know, why why must we only look at one group? It, you know, and you, you think of Sabbatai Zevi, he was either an Islamic infiltrator or he converted to Islam. And uh, so we have ties to that there and to the Kabbalah, et cetera. So why don't people... You know, think about these other things, but we must be liars if we uh, dare to mention any of this. Well, yeah, I mean, so we've said plenty. Um, we were distracted, and I do apologize for that, but I, I felt we had to clear up some of these things. And um, I did get through most of what I wanted to, plus extra, um, because there's so much misinformation that's coming out now. I guess I need to clarify our position on that. Yeah. It's unfortunate that they don't have any integrity and they're trying to suppress this video. I mean, that that to me says the real agenda right there is they don't want these citations in this work out. They've got to thumb down the video and try to suppress it and take over the chat and lie and insult and name call and all of this stuff. And it's just, you know, it's sad. And But I think it shows the real agenda behind what these people are up to. So and, and these... this this person peaceful po pogrom is you know oh we bring up one thing but not how Frankus and the Catholic Church and the Jesuits and oh my God it's like it is a really channel covering that go there we're just, we're talking about this topic you can Tell go you on what. your channel and do you can do those of videos and I'll insist that you can talk about horses okay yeah exactly you know it's like this this idiot uh, Fibonacci earlier he couldn't even grasp for a second that this episode is focused on the Torah even though it's right in the title of the show. And when we get to the Talmud, the word Talmud will be in the title of the show. <gasps> Thank you, Weston. Yeah. Look, I needed to cover that because that's the basis, the written law and then the oral law. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll continue with that. And Are yeah, we supposed to provide an echo chamber? No, you're supposed to have the intelligence to fact check and present facts and truths and not constantly regurgitate blatantly fake Talmud quotes in second and third hand sources. So yeah, see they're still pounding the uh the thumbs down button. I mean they're obviously very afraid of well, any thinking any, and fact checking. Any rational person now goes to look at these citations and compares them with what is being shown on, on, on you know YouTube and on the web they'll realize that the Talmud doesn't say those things if they actually read it. Yeah. The, the, against the Talmud is a different case, right? But the Talmud is ultimately based on the written law, which is the Torah. Yeah, so. see, Lisa says, uh, that's just childish. I don't know why you trolls are so coordinated about ta attacking this channel. That's exactly right. They are coordinated. Yeah. It's, you know, GDL and a few different groups. And they don't want uh, the facts out because if people realize that, you know, at least half of the stuff that they're selling is false and that they're spreading lies, well, Satan is the father of all lies. And that means they're as guilty as those they are accusing. So, you know, that's rather disturbing when you, you know, realize that they are spreading all of these lies and trying to suppress real research. So, Javi says a lot of the oral traditions come from Babylon and not from the Torah. One could make that argument to a degree that does seem to be a creep of paganism into some of the Talmudic uh, law. But that's something we'd like to explore and provide something solid and not just go, it's paganism, you know, yeah. full stop. Well, and I've often come to the conclusion that uh, Judaism has a lot of ties to paganism as well. And of course, they, you know, the claim, the official claim is that uh, Christianity came out of paganism. I think, it, you know, in my own opinion, the opposite is true, but that's a whole other, you know, segue. Well, so, thank you, Stephen. you know, at least there's a few people in there with integrity that aren't uh, afraid of, you know, facts and truth and, and thinking things through and fact checking and looking up citations and, you know, sending me, you know, a link to the Talmud and saying, see, that one line is there while they ignore the surrounding well, paragraphs. So Booth Booth says you're reading something that's allegedly almost 2,000 years old, has been rewritten and reinterpreted how many times? But we're supposed to take it as the facts, just like the Bible, okay? 
well, then why should we believe your Torah messages? Because if the Torah is 2,000 years old and it's been rewritten, why should we think that anything that you say about it is true? <laughs> and also the Bible has 30,000 copies of the original documents, which can be verified and checked to see if the Bible has maintained integrity and it has, right? So that's something that has solid history behind it. Um, but look, you guys are welcome. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Sorry about the distractions, but we've been dealing with a lot of these issues, but we, we felt we needed to address them. So yeah, let's next week not get too sidetracked. Yeah, definitely. And, and also those guys who are making the hit piece videos, thank you for the advertising. We do appreciate it. Yep. And, uh, you know, they just, you know, they're exposing themselves at this point when they intentionally lie and distort and take, take our statements out of context. I mean, yeah. they, their hit pieces aren't even accurately presenting what we say. Well, think so. about it. I'm Jewish, Jesuit, Christian, Catholic, Muslim, ex-Muslim, Mossad, CIA. Mo Mormon. Uh, yeah, Mormon. Uh, jihadi. Like, okay. Okay. Well, you they've covered all yeah. of their bases so that no matter what you are, one of them might end up true. The only thing I have me called is an Eskimo, guys. Seriously. Lloyd, are you an Eskimo? Uh, that's classified information. <laughs> Whatever. I'm a Muslim, Christian, Jewish, ex-Muslim. Well, be careful. You said that last week, and then uh, one of these uh, hit piece trolls, they took that clip out of context and tried to use that as your admission, you know? So uh, whatever, whatever. It, it gets, you know, thanks. And I'm a white guy. Hold on. Hang on. I'm a white guy. <laughs> yeah. You're not. Yeah. You're not. Uh, guy, you're not guy. Dutch you're and you're not South African <laughs> and you're not German. And, you know, and all of these. Good grief, whatever. man. It's it's uh, amusing to watch them. So uh, anyway, thank you thanks. You know, thanks for your support, folks. We really appreciate those who have you know thrown in and supported the show tonight. Uh, this episode has been, uh, or this series has been tough because, you know, I stated at the very launch of this series that we would get attacked for this and for putting out primary citations that anyone with an IQ over 95 can fact check. And, uh, you know, we are getting, you know, we are getting those heavy attacks. So, uh, you know, please help support the show and please, you know, contribute so that we can, uh, keep doing this against all of the onslaught because they're clearly going to try to suppress this sh this episode as much as they can okay, well, let's leave it um guys please read your citations check your fact check the citations i give and read the books please masons are islam high iq yeah okay um yeah we showed the evidence for that but again ignore the obvious and lie again so let's just block these people anyway good night everybody Take care right. and uh, see you next week. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.